This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. And we are another episode of Art of Darkness. I'm Brad Kelly. This is Kevin Kautzman. Uh, this is this is going to be a banger. This is this is a classic. This is just Kevin and I in the room talking about a great artist, talking about their darkness, talking about what they contributed, talking about their life. Uh, first off, Kevin, how are you doing, man? Never better, Brad. Excellent. I am jacked for this. I am ready to crush my enemies and hear the lamentations <laughs> of their their partners right right <laughs> their lamentations of their polycule yeah that's right i would have their whole polycule shriek and then the, and then the one solo poly person off in the distance just alone on valentine's day <laughs> that's right that's right uh you know quick housekeeping you know if you if you like to share you like what we do you want our bonus content which includes a 20 to 30 minute uh, after dark episode for each and every episode we do including this one uh want to get in on the 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 watch along parties we're we're going to try to ramp that back up we kind of stepped away from that for a minute but we got one coming um and the book club book club um right now we are reading um wise blood by flannery o'connor um yeah, there Kevin's holding it up there. Wonderful novel. We've got some some activity in the chat. People seem to like that book. We're going to be talking about that on February 24th. And if you don't want to actually sit in the Zoom room with us and hang out, I get it. Um, those are recorded and and you can access them at any time. If you are a paid subscriber at Art of Dark, well, Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. But also, uh, we're now this on is a Substack. big deal. Yes. This is a big deal. Okay. And I want to, <laughs> before Brad proceeds, I want to say, Patreon folks, you don't have to change anything. Nope. For those who are already on Patreon, Brad has taken the time. He has made the effort. We are uh, uh, platform polyamorous. Yeah, we wanted a true. backup of yes. what's on Patreon because you never know. So Brad went ahead and did what? What did you do, Brad? We just we have basically cloned what we're doing on Patreon over to Substack. So now you can get you can you know you can get in and get Patreon as we've described, but you can get the exact same thing over at Substack. Substack.com slash at art of dark pod. So it's gonna be the same thing, same issue, same content, everything. Same so price. After this, yeah. Exactly. So after we record this core episode, we'll do the Patreon after dark. I'll post that and at the exact same time, mm -hmm. Brad will post Right after mm -hmm. I post it to Patreon, it will be posted on Substack. Indeed. Everybody's equal. The whole point of this, again, is for us to have a backup. And also, if people don't, if people prefer Substack over Patreon, there you go. You can just stay yeah. with Substack. And I think this is wise, Brad, because we've yeah. got, we got a lot of readers. We got That's a lot true. of literary people. We got a lot of people who are probably more predisposed to Substack. So I think this is a very good idea, Brad. Yep. That's, uh, that's, the, that was my thought process. It was like some people are going to have 10 Substack subscriptions and they don't have Patreon. And sure. it's just easier for them, right? Just absolutely. Us, so. Absolutely. Yep. And and if and if somebody at Substack ends up having a vendetta against us, we have Patreon. And <laughs> right. if the Patreon people just find out about the incident, we have Substack. Yes. That's and, right. And surely the two platforms don't talk to one another they don't go to the same part they aren't in the same polycule out in right. in, Men right. in menlo park right, right, uh, right, right. now now uh, one more time for the people in the back for the solo poly person in the back mm. brad uh mm. it is substack.com slash art of dark pod slash at art of dark pod our Guys, handle on there is at, dar art, of at art of dark pod very good i will add it to the website mm -hmm. who are we covering today we are covering robert E. Howard. And I'm going to just ask a question. Kevin, what do you know about Robert E. Howard? Here's what I know. Conan the Barbarian, Texas, pulp author, mid-century, first half of the 20th earlier, century, yep, earlier. Yep. Uh, 
That's what I know. Okay. I don't know a hell of a lot about this guy. Somebody uh, on Twitter today said he's what you he's he's what you get. You know, Love Lovecraft comes from the prim and proper Northeast. Mm-hmm. This guy comes from the raucous oil boom, Texas. Yes. That's okay. exactly right. That's exactly so, right. Yeah. I cannot yeah. wait to find out more. That's one of the reasons that I love doing this show. And I have no doubt you're gonna you're gonna okay. bring the heat. Yeah, indeed. Well, we're actually gonna start with the biography of Conan the Barbarian. Conan ah. the Sumerian, Conan uh the destroyer, King Conan, all these things. Okay, we're gonna start those there. movies as a kid. Those movies <laughs> terrified me as a kid. <laughs> so good right? you gotta imagine saturday <laughs> afternoon you know we probably, probably went bowling with my great aunt great aunt. we went to go bowling league and you know mm-hmm. so, uh, saturday morning cartoons and then on tbs or something here comes this two o'clock matinee conan the whatever yeah and it's and they're huge co- muscle bound arnie Arn- we're gonna yeah, sort around we're gonna sort around <laughs> and all this craziness and then yeah. and then later you see the unedited version at your friend's house he's chopping heads off heads are rolling it's like yeah. you don't know you, you you feel you got tingly feel you're feeling things you never felt before yeah that's that's right that's exactly <laughs> as a 10 right. year old boy you're discovering things you oh didn't no know. there are neurons lighting up and like <laughs> dna switching on that you didn't know you had yeah absolutely yeah the great um, the great john milius of course yes yeah absolutely mm. and at some point we're gonna watch conan conan the barbarian in the watch party for patreon and sub supporters awesome yeah. can't wait to do yeah. that yeah um, okay, so let me read. I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to tell you the biography because I, I wanted to kind of start with some Robert E. Howard words, um, and you know, just so we know what he sounds like. In 1932, he writes um, effectively the first Conan story called uh, "Phoenix on the Sword," and it starts like this. <laughs> and this is actually this bit that I'm reading is actually um, it's a it's an epigraph from a book. It's not a real book. It's a book that Robert E. Howard is using as a as a plot device, right? So this is from the Namidian Chronicles. <clears throat> Quote, Know, O prince, that between the years when the oceans drank Atlantis and the gleaming cities and the years of the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of when shining kingdoms lay spread across the world like blue mantles beneath the stars, Namidia, Ophir, Brythunia, Hyperborea, Zamora with its dark-haired women and towers of spider-haunted mystery, Zingara with its chivalry, Koth that bordered on the pastoral lands of Shem, Stygia with its shadow-guarded tombs, Hyrcania whose riders wore steel and silk and gold, but the proudest kingdom of the world was Aquilonia, reigning supreme in the dreaming west. Hither came Conan, the Cimmerian, black-haired, sullen-eyed, sword in hand, a thief, a reaver, a slayer, with gigantic melancholies and gigantic mirth to tread the jeweled thrones of the earth under his sandaled feet. Yeah. <laughs> Some pretty good prose. It's pretty good, man. A little, pur- this... little purple, a little over the right. top. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but uh, intentionally, Robert E. Howard is not pulling any punches. He's going to go. He's going to go for it. Right. Go big or go home. Um, OK, so I'm going to read just a little bit more. <clears throat> Um, this is from later in Phoenix and the Sword, but but it gives us a little a little bit of a little bit of what Robert I. E. Howard's mind frame is, and a little bit about what the Conan thing is. <clears throat> Quote: Alone of us all, Ronaldo has no personal ambition. He sees in Conan a red-handed, rough-footed barbarian who came out of the north to plunder a civilized land. He idealizes the king whom Conan killed to get the crown, remembering only that he occasionally patronized the arts and forgetting the evils of his reign, and he is making the people forget. Already they openly sing the lament for the king in which Ronaldo lauds the sainted villain and denounces Conan as that black-hearted savage from the abyss. Conan laughs, but the people snarl. Why does he hate Conan? Poets always hate those in power. To them, perfection is always just behind the last corner or beyond the next. They escape the present in dreams of the past and future. Rinaldo is a flaming torch of an idealism, rising, as he thinks, to overthrow a tyrant and liberate the people. As for me, well, a few months ago, I had lost all ambition but to raid the caravans for the rest of my life. Now old dreams stir. Conan will die. Dion will mount the throne. Then he, too, will die. One by one, all who oppose me will die by fire or steel or or those deadly wines you know so well how to brew. Escalante, king of Aquilonia, 
how do you like the sound of it? So just again, giving this flavor and I'm, I'm intentionally throwing a bunch of Robert E. Howard words at you, people, place names. None of it's going to make any sense if you're not already a, a Robert E. Howard stan, but hopefully by the end of it, at least you'll have a picture of what he's creating. And Robert E. Howard created a world. There's a lot of um, argument in the niche communities, niche genre communities about pitting Tolkien's built world against Robert E. Howard's built world. Not saying one of them is better than the other, but Robert E. Howard built a world if he eventually would have built a world on this scale if he would have kept going. Okay. Um, and we'll, we'll get to more of that now, a little bit more about Conan's background. Um, uh, so Conan, the Sumerian lives in what's called the Hyborian age. This is between the sinking of the Atlantis and the beginning of recorded ancient history. The Sumerians of this time are ancestors of the ancient. This is all fictional, right? This is all what Robert E. Howard's made up. The Sumerians of this time. I, are I the got ancient. it. I got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to we make don't, sure. We don't want to confuse. We're not one of those podcasts. Right. Yeah. Right. We're, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the Sumerians of this time are the ancestors of the ancient Gauls, themselves the ancestors of the of the Irish and the Highland Scots. Um, Robert E. Howard seems to have in my, have had in mind the uh, Cimric, which is ancient Welsh, the Cimbri, which are the ancient peoples of Jutland and the Danes. Those are real groups, right? Cimric and the, the Cimbri. Um, also the Gimara and the uh, Scythian. And then there were actually a people, a, 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 a tribe or an ethnicity uh, that were the Sumerians. These were ancient Eastern Iranic nomads. So Sumerian, there were in history, a group of people called this in Conan, Conan, the one, the tribe that Conan came from is a fictionalized conglomeration using that name. Conan was born on a battlefield to a village blacksmith and rapidly matured into a respectable fighting force by the age of 15 when he destroyed the Aquilonian uh, fortress of Venarium. Aquilonia is the stand-in for medieval Western Europe. It was <clears throat> during the Hyborian Age. It's the most advanced kingdom. We'll talk more about that. As Conan grew, grew he was struck by wonder, wanderlust and began a period of what they called high adventure, right? Uh, fighting monsters, fighting wizards, um, having, you know, kind of rough-edged romances with everybody from tavern wenches to princesses. <laughs> he roamed the Hyborian Age as a thief in stories like Tower of the Elephant, as an outlaw, as a mercenary, uh, 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 even a pirate. Um, his legend grew as he began to command units of warriors, like in the story um, People of the Black Circle, and he eventually seizes the crown of Aquilonia, um, as in Phoenix on the Sword. You know what's fun is like to, yeah. to this day you can you can decide to become a tavern wench. You can just that <laughs> they like exist. you can they make a choice. Exist. They exist. This yeah. thing, and you know what? More power to you. I think that's amazing. And you can decide to be a a rogue, a wandering mm -hmm. rogue. You can you can save up fifteen thousand dollars and buy a van, mm -hmm. and and you could have a sword in the back. You could have a katana in the back. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, true. I, mean, yeah. I like this. I like this. When, when was he writing this stuff? When so the, the Conan stories yeah. came in the 1930s, between 1932 that, that feels, and 1935. Well, and so we got kind of like a depression. There's like a mm. depression era thing. Oh, and of course you want to escape into this fantasy of this big muscle-bound hero of who hits, hits the highway and yeah. gets the girl and conquers yeah. his enemies. And yep. Yeah, cool, dude. Exactly. So much fun. Exactly. Yeah. Um. There's a I'm going to I'm going to read just a little bit from uh, uh, actually from the bio. So my my primary source for the biographical material, I have a handful of, of books of Robert E. Howard's writing, which we'll reference. But my primary source for the biographical material is this book called Blood and Thunder, The Life and Art of Robert E. Howard by a gentleman named Mark Finn. I want to hold this up, Kevin, because what do you see on the cover there? <laughs> I see a uh, doughy man with. Does yeah. he have a knife or a, a yeah. shiv in his right hand? And then he's yeah. got a. He got. He's got like a little pistol. It looks like yeah. maybe a little twenty-two. I can't really yeah. tell. Yeah. But he's got. He's got a roll sitting on top. He's got a shelf. Uh, uh, you know, kind of above his pants. His pants are very high. Yeah. Uh, he looks like he looks like a bottom shelf Hemingway figure here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. yeah. I dig yeah. it. Yeah. He was. He was. A, you know. He. He was a fairly macho dude. And it's funny. At one point, he was described as big. And, hmm. um, and, and, and we'll talk more about this, but at one point it, I read in there that he was six foot 195 and I was like, that's not that big. Like, no, I got, 
Uh, I'm not going to say how many pounds yeah. I got on him, but right. I was at the gym today. This is yeah, another day yeah. I had to go to the gym. You but, can't do but, this episode without. Yeah. But that's like a that's like a medium, extra medium guy. That's not like a big guy. Like no, if you saw a six foot one ninety five, you don't go, wow, that guy's huge. Mm, this is like a guy. So anyway, yeah, I wonder if what that well, has they to do were, with. They were tinier back then. That's what I think it is. Yeah. 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 That's one of the first things I noticed as like a corn fed uh, redneck and a turtleneck from the Midwest when I got to the East Coast. I was like, oh, I'm, I got a head and shoulders over a lot of these people. I'm going <laughs> to, <Right>. this is good. <laughs> right. Naturally, right. but they, you know, but they, but they have a higher IQ. So, well, <laughs> supposedly. supposedly. Right. That's, that's what yeah. they say. Yeah. That's yeah. what they say in their journals and their papers. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting. So they, yeah, 195 and six foot. I mean, I don't even know what that, yeah, that doesn't strike me as a huge yeah. guy. Not a big, not a huge guy, not a small guy, but not a huge no. guy. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the story. Um, <clears throat> this is from a story called Beyond the Black River. Um, and, this is here. Basically, Conan has rescued this young Aquilonian guy from the deep woods, um, and they're um, they're engaged. <clears throat> the Aquilonian kingdom. This is the frontier of the Aquilonian kingdom at the Black River. West of here is territory that's completely controlled by barbarian tribes or picked tribes. Conan's the only non-pictish person that's ever been able to cross over into the past the Black River. Anyway. We'll talk more about this story because this is Beyond the Black River is probably my favorite Conan story. Um, so, OK, here's here's just something. But this is Conan describing his own life to this young Aquilonian. Quote, I've roamed far, farther than any other man of my race ever wandered. I've seen all the great cities of the Hyborians, the Shemites, the Stygians, the Hyrcanians. I've roamed in the unknown countries south of the Black Kingdoms of Cush and east of the Sea of Iliet. I've been mercenary, captain, corsar, kozak, a penniless vagabond, a general. Hell, I've been everything except a king, and I may be that before I die. So he is characterized by superhuman strength and prowess, but also tactical intelligence, you know, animalistic power, supreme self-confidence, um, and, you know, a kind of personal code which involves chivalry towards damsels, but he will not hesitate to murder anyone who is against him. There's no, there's, there's no Batman where, like, I'm the good guy because I don't kill people. He will just, if you're a problem, he will split your skull with an enormous sword. <laughs> Pretty, I love it. Good. Simpler yeah. times. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, there's just like a there's just like a real like he's not screwing around kind of thing here. Um get off a, my lawn. Exactly. Exactly. Um as a character Conan began to appear in short stories uh first as a remembered past life in the 1931 story People of the Dark which was a actually a Cthulhu mythos story. So Robert E. Howard wrote a handful of stories that were explicitly in the Cthulhu, in Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos on purpose. Um, in the story, People of the Dark appeared in um, Strange Tales. Howard would proceed to write um, Conan into approximately 21 stories uh, between 1931 and 1936. Others would eventually would later pick up the thread, including um, L. Sprague de Camp, um, who wrote the Lovecraft biography we used back in the H.P. Lovecraft episode. Um, and the comp would actually issue a book in 1967 called simply Conan featuring highly edited editions of Howard's stories, as well as new Conan to tales by uh, writers Bjorn Nyberg and Lynn Carter. The original Conan stories were actually out of print until 1977 um, when Berkeley books issued three volumes using the original, original text with no DeCamp edits. A lot of Conan fans hate El Sprague DeCamp. El Sprague DeCamp, we're not going to get too deep into it. He did not seem to actually respect what Howard was doing. He just seemed to be in the right place at the right time and saw the commercial opportunities. It uh, didn't seem like he actually understood the underlying thesis and why people liked Conan. Yeah, um, that seems to happen a lot. They seem to mm -hmm. give projects under a certain name, something the, yeah. hypothetical, like True Detective. They seem to give a project yeah. like that to yeah. somebody just... Yeah. <laughs> that could it could still happen yeah. it's, it's like yes. it's like sort of subconsciously the industry the media film television publishing kind of wants to kind of wants to take the nuts off of stuff it's like it, it kinda, they can't they help wanna, themselves you can't help themselves and it's yeah. just like there's a they can't i don't know it's hard to explain but yeah. it, it, it continues to this day right 
It does. Indeed. Indeed. Um, 1980s and 1990s, the Conan copyright was actually allowed to lapse. Um, and then came a whole bunch of new Conan works from all kinds of people. In the 1970s, we got the beginning of a long run in Marvel Comics with the series Conan the Barbarian and then Savage Sword of Conan. And later there was a series in Dark Horse. And then, of course, there's the movies. There's a bunch of video games. It's a whole it's a whole enterprise. Right. Um, of course, the, the in, late night talk show. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> exactly. There's no relation. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah, right. No reason. Really. Like in an alternate universe, it's uh, a <laughs> guy has a broadsword. Yeah. Right. You don't entertain Just us. Goofy and like tall and redhead. And, <laughs> wacky yeah. and wacky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So who is the guy that came up with Conan? He didn't. He came up with a lot more than Conan the Barbarian, Conan, Conan the Sumerian. But we're going to get into that. Um, but let's talk about him now. So <clears throat> he's born January January twenty second, nineteen oh six in the unincorporated community of Piaster, Texas, about an hour and a half west of Dallas. He would live his entire life in Texas, primarily in this in the town of uh, Cross Plains, which is about two and a half hours west at a little south of Dallas and is just north of the geographical dead center of Texas. So literally the middle of Texas. Um, now, in order to contextualize Robert E. Howard's life, and understand who he was and where he came from. We have to understand a little bit, but a little bit about the oil boom. So bear with me while I give you a few minute breakdown of the oil boom and how this bears on being a Texan in 1906. Um, <clears throat> now, the Texas oil boom, also sometimes referred to as the Gusher Age. Okay, this is the period. This is what Robert E. Howard lives through. To understand it, it we kind of have to n- understand that in the 19th century. There basically wasn't any use for oil until the advent of relatively cheap and efficient um, internal combustion engines came along, um, starting with the auto engine in 1876. As the technology gets re- refined, when we start moving away from from coal engines, steam engines are an external combustion engine. We, you know, we, we're in, the internal combustion engine was sort of the next revolution. Um, the demand for oil increases through the late 19th century. And then in 1901 in Beaumont, Texas, prospectors discover the spindle top gusher. It is perhaps the largest oil find up until that time with a gusher that blew for nine days at a rate of a hundred thousand barrels of oil per day. I um, should call her. <laughs> uh, the spindle top uh, gusher, huh? Uh, holy uh, moly. Yeah. I'm looking that one up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you get you don't have safe search on, do you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, holy moly! Yeah, no, look at that thing, dude. I'm on Wikipedia. Yeah. I mean, this is yeah, this is not safe for work. No, the Lucas yeah. Gusher at Spindletop. Yeah, damn, yeah. dude. Oh, and that's right over by Houston, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So the companies Gulf Oil and Texco were formed to develop this site, the Spindletop Gusher. Um, and it, it literally, this one site basically just shoved America into the oil age. Um, we went, it went from oil went from being like something that you used for like lighting and like lubricants and stuff to being like a mass produced commodity that everybody needed. Um, and once Spindletop went off, you know, not only those two companies, but there's multiple decades of of, uh, of this area growing with oil companies, prospectors, land developers, real estate investors, you know, roughnecks, all kinds of things. And um, it things grew so fast. Okay, before Spindletop Blue, there were no large cities in Texas. There were zero large cities. Um, in 1900, Houston was a very small commercial center. And in 1910, in 10 years, its population doubled to 80,000 80, people. And now it's like, what is it, the fifth biggest city in the country or something like that? I mean, they have that that triangle is massive. DF, mm-hmm. DFW is like the second or third largest metro in the country uh, by yeah. population. And I think then, Houston, I think Houston's big. Well, uh, well, if you include Fort Worth, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, well, there's a whole what in any case, you got DFW, you got Austin in the middle, then you got San Antonio, then you have Houston. I mean, they have like those are four of the most important metros in the in mm-hmm. the country. Oh, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, now, the way it tended to work, this oil boom is that there was this big boom and then all these little towns would have their own boom when they found like a little reservoir or a field somewhere. Um, so you'd get some sleepy little crossroads with 500 people living there and then someone would strike oil and a month later it's a bustling like it triples in size like immediately. And the kinds of people, you know, th- this is 
you know, so you get the kind of there will be blood, the, the Daniel Plainview type people, but you also get um, you also get a lot of uh, men who are rootless, wild and temporarily rich. Right. Just flooding into your town, um, and, you know, include plus the various entrepreneurs from restaurant owners to prostitutes to, you know, everything in between. Um, and of course, consequently, crime also skyrockets so you know fighting alcohol you know prostitution as i said any you know you name it um suddenly suddenly you're some sleepy a lot of you, a lot of jaywalking happened, right happened. that's right right <laughs> well and you suddenly go from a town that has like its worst cases like ah uh, you know some kid kicked a cow to like all of a sudden <laughs> there's like people stabbing each other you know yeah. it, it gets it yeah. gets crazy mm -hmm. real quick mm -hmm. um uh, now, Robert E. Howard is born 1906, five years after Spindletop, and he would land in his adolescence in the boomtown of Cross Plains. Um, and he had this to say in a 1931 letter he wrote to Farnsworth Wright, who is the editor of Weird Tales. Weird Tales is the most iconic of the pulp magazines that uh, had Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, and um, <clears throat> Clark Ashton Smith, and a number of other people. It was the big, it was. Weirdly enough, it wasn't the most well sold at the time, but now it is thought of as the sort of the epicenter of this of this thing that that is that is speculative, you know, genre pulp fiction. Um, Howard had this to say, quote, I'll say one thing about an oil boom. It will teach a kid that life's a pretty rotten thing as quick as anything I can think of. He did not like living in a boom town. Not at all. And we'll get into more reasons why. Um, Okay, but let's first, before we get there, let's talk about Robert E. Howard's lineage. Uh, some of it is kind of hard to determine. Some of it is kind of lost in tall tales. But Howard claimed, and at least some of this is true, that he had three great uncles who were involved in the 1849 gold rush, that he had relatives who fought with old Hickory, that's Andrew Jackson, in 1812 in New Orleans, um, <clears throat> that's the people who don't know the battle of new orleans is the last big war of 1812 we talk about it actually in the john kennedy tool episode quite a bit if you go back um, and by the that. way happy mardi gras it's hey, mardi gras today right. so there you go to our yeah. uh, our friends yeah. uh, in new orleans and everybody who uh, observes lent what do you give it up for lent brad uh sugar you give it up sugar for lent Trying. like anything that has added sugar i mean you All can't right. you can't get away from it 100 percent. but like okay yeah. okay I have yeah. a sweet tooth. What All right, you, Kevin? my man. I think I'm gonna delete. I think I'm gonna delete Twitter from my phone for for Lent. Hell That's yeah. what I think I'm gonna do. Just for my phone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good <laughs> and move. see how I do. See how That's I smart. do. That's smart. All right. Yep. Um, he had uh, Robert E. Howard said that both of his grandfathers rode for Bedford Forest. People who maybe don't know Bedford Forest, he is who Forrest Gump was named after, but he was also a Confederate Army general and later Grand Wizard of the KKK. Hmm. Uh, Howard had another great, I had a great grandfather who was in the Confederate Army, as well as numerous great uncles who were in, who fought for the Confederacy. Um, were they, did they fight for Texas or did they fight, were they Louisiana? It's not uh, clear. I, I think I don't I think that's a good question. I don't think they all came to te I don't think they all fought for Texas. They were all kind of scattered around, especially his one grandfather, Colonel George Irvin, came to Texas, I believe, after the war. Sure. Um, he came to Texas after fighting, you know, in the Civil War, mined silver, fought Apaches, right? And bought ended up buying up a whole bunch. At one point he bought he owned a whole bunch of land that later became Dallas, but he kind of lost his <laughs> right. mind and he sold right. it off first. Um, that's such so, a funny thing to think about too. Like we, we talk about this sometimes up here in Minnesota because one of my yeah. friends, actually a buddy of mine who first prompted me to podcast, you know, him. uh, mm. you know, you, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. He knows the entire history of like the region and you can still name the families that own parcels of land in it up here. It goes back to like the early French settlers. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Kinda, it's easy to forget that, like, yeah, yeah, the people who got here first owned this land and then it got built up. And now it's just like they just sit on piles of money from land they sold Some like them, two and a half years ago. As long as they stayed sober and like passed mm. the money down like that, that's, right. that's a huge part of the story of this country. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I got one thing to say at this point in the podcast. Yeah. Yeehaw. <laughs> Yeehaw. Right? 
right? We're yeah, here we are. You put me <laughs> in place and time. Yeah, now I'm going to give you good. another little I'm going to give you another little thing. So, uh, Howard's mother who is very keen to assert the families and and she's the daughter of a of a Confederate colonel, right? She's very keen to assert the family's nobility or Howard's no, nobility. Um he might have gotten some of these bulk, some claims about his lineage from her, but let me read you a little thing from his bio in a letter that he that he wrote um, about his, you know, his his family history. <clears throat> Quote, and this is to August Derleth. Um, He wrote this in 1934. People may know August Derleth is a guy who created Arkham House kind of I think after Lovecraft died and and like reprinted all of the Lovecraft stuff that had appeared in Weird Tales. <clears throat> Quote. One of the main reasons I've always hoped success would come my way was so I could travel. There are hundreds of places in my own state I've never seen, though I've roamed over a goodly portion of it. I suppose I've done less traveling than any of my family for hundreds of years back. They were always a race of wanderers, all branches of my various lines, and seldom stayed long in the locality in which they were born. My father was born in southern Arkansas, my mother in eastern Texas, my maternal grandfather in North Carolina, my maternal grandmother in middle Tennessee, my paternal grandfather in Georgia, my paternal grandmother in Alabama. And they married in Mississippi. My paternal grandmother's father was born in South Carolina, and his father was born on the Atlantic Ocean in an immigrant ship. And his father, his father, was born in County Galway, Ireland. My great great grandfather, the one born on the ocean, was carried ashore at New York, then southward by his family. And his wife was from the west coast of Ireland. And their son, my great grandfather, born in South Carolina, married a Georgia woman whose father was born in Denmark. I've had aunts, uncles, and cousins born in every southern state there is except Kentucky and Florida and a few in the Midwest. Most of them I've never seen. I have relatives all over East Texas, northern northern Louisiana, southern and western Arkansas, southern and northern Missouri, and eastern and middle Oklahoma, and very few of them have I ever seen. Okay, so. Uh, is it very interesting because that, that uh, uh, he's kind of doing an I've been everywhere man thing. Right. That is but an echo of how he described how Conan described what he had done earlier. It sounds like a similar thing. This guy likes likes lists. He, he likes does. like a comprehensive <laughs> da da da. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I yeah, was a he, fighter. He, I was a lover. I was a warrior. I got cousins <laughs> right. everywhere, man. I've been right. everywhere, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah the guy yeah. who sits next to you at the bar won't shut up. Yeah. 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 In in the in truth, as far as I can tell, um, he at least as an adult robert e howard only left the state of texas once hey listen so, yeah if you if you get to texas you don't have to leave that is a, a fact that is a big state <laughs> yeah, i gotta say state. man if there's like one state in the union that mm -hmm. where you can like if they said you got to go there and you can never leave again you could do a hell of a lot worse in terms yeah. of like if you're somebody who likes new and interesting things mm -hmm. you could live an entire life in that state and it would you probably never get never get bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, yeah. it's just dope. Yeah, it's huge. It's a country. It's, it's a country of its, of its own. It's huge. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so let's talk about his father briefly. His father was a man named Isaac Mordecai Howard. He was born in 1872, Holly Springs, Arkansas. Second youngest of six. He moved with his mother. His father died when he was young. Uh, to Texas when he was 13 years old, and his old and his oldest brother took responsibility for the family. Isaac Howard graduated from quote unquote, medical school in 1905 and spent the ensuing years ch chasing various booms, whether cattle, land, railroad or oil for more than a decade afterward. Yeah. Why did you put scare quotes around medical school? Well, it's not medical school in Texas in 1900 is not right. like right. when you imagine your kid going to become a doctor, right. he's not going through what they come, went come here, come here, son. Yeah. I'm going to need you to cut off this toe. Right. Yes, he's still alive. Put it in his mouth. Right. I'm going to need you to cut off this toe. And if he yelps, yeah. Yeah. keep cutting. Yeah, you got to right? yeah. cut, cut the toe out to cut the toe off to let the ghosts out. See? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, the ghosts get trashed in there. We got to get the ghosts out. Here's your certificate. Right. Now, <laughs> <laughs> we got so ghosts here. Uh, that's very funny. I, you know, the other thing I wanted to say was Mordecai. You don't hear that name much anymore, do you? You don't. Mordecai. You don't hear that name much. If you, if, I, if a guy shows up to like do your plumbing or do your your lights or whatever, and he's hmm. like Mordecai, you got yeah. you you respect that. I I do Strong trust a Mordecai. Name. I would I trust, trust a Mordecai. Mordecai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Somebody was taking something serious in his, you know. Hmm. 
His parents made a yeah, real, are, real decision. There are, there. there are any yeah. toe ghosts in the Mordecai family. <laughs> That's right. Uh, his mother. <laughs> his mother is Hester Howard Nee Irvin, uh, born in Dallas, Texas, 1870. She's the, like we said, daughter of a Confederate journal, journal, Confederate colonel. She had nine siblings. Uh Hester's mother died when Hester was four and the family relocated to Louisville, Texas, where um, she had uh, where he had another six kids. Um, so after some wanderings, uh, this family Chase and silver in New Mexico, among other things, they settled for a while in Missouri, where Hester contracted tuberculosis around 1890. This would eventually be her end, but she lived with it her whole life, usually as a secret. Um, so she was tubercular and you know, kind of just hid from people a lot of the times, especially when the symptoms were bad. Eventually, while living in Mineral Wells with some siblings, she met Isaac Howard and they married in 1904. He was 32 and she was 34. I'm going to read a quick little thing um, about her and this whole scenario. It's interesting. They only end up having the one kid, Hester and um, and Isaac. But they both come from huge families. Massive right? families. Right. You got nine right. siblings. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah she had yeah. nine siblings already. And then her dad had another six and they all lived in the same house. It's right. Like 16 people. <laughs> yeah. And they all lived. They all lived to. Apparently. Maturity? Yeah. I mean, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Oof. huge. And his and, and uh, Robert you, Howard's You've got dad an entire had... football team and you can swap people out for special teams. You got a backup <laughs> quarterback. Right. Yeah. 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 You're making yourself your own militia. Yeah. For real. For real. And his dad and Howard's dad had six, uh, five siblings. That's a big. That's a big family too. Six kids. Is Absolutely. A big Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, here's about Hester. Quote: Hester was gracious and charming. Um, this is when they were young. Isaac was forceful and magnetic. She was maternal and caring. He was dashing and intense. It is not difficult to imagine that Hester saw much of her father in Isaac, just as Isaac saw characteristics of his mother in Hester. Both came from large roaming families, but they lacked the desire to settle down and cultivate a large family themselves. In this, they were very much like kindred spirits. Now, uh, Robert is born in 1906. His mother nursed him and being tubercular, it seems there were... Robert was probably fairly sickly as a child. Um, when he was about a year and a half years old, his mother miscarried. And it's there's some evidence to suggest that after this, Hester basically just checked out of the marriage. I mean, they never got divorced or le really left each other or anything, but it seems like she was no longer really in it in the marriage, let's say. She was a could be a nervous, dramatic woman. She also seemed to suffer depression from depression, especially after losing that second child. Um, Robert's first years up until from uh, 1906 to 1916, he would the family were, was basically nomadic. They moved constantly several times a year. They would pick up and move to some other part of Texas. Um, and as you can imagine, fairly destabilizing for a kid. But let me let me read a little bit about this. Um, this is a letter, uh, this is a letter that Robert E. Howard wrote to H.P. Lovecraft in 1930, <clears throat> quote, why, by the time I was nine years old, I'd lived in the Palo Pinto Hills of central Texas in a small town, only 50 miles from the coast on a ranch in Atascoca, at a Atascosa County in San Antonio on the South Plains, close to the New Mexico, New Mexican line in the Wichita file of Wichita Falls country up next to Oklahoma and in the piney woods of Red River over next to Arkansas. If you glance at a map of Texas, you'll note that covers considerable considerable distance altogether. And I didn't mention a few short stays in Missouri and Oklahoma. I've lived in land boom towns, railroad boom towns, oil boom towns where life was raw and primitive. And all I can say is Texas is just too big for me to grasp. Okay, so uh, we don't know really because because of all these movies, we don't know a ton about his childhood, but um, we know we can start to see uh, some of the magic that he would later draw on for his stories um, and, you know, kind of how sometimes stories can live sort of undiscovered in history. Um, there's a letter he wrote about sort of some of his 
just kind of geographical influences, the influences of living where he lived um, in the time he lived and around the people he lived. Um, this is another letter to Lovecraft. <laughs> Quote, uh, the one to whom I listened most was the cook. Excuse me, old uh, old aunt Mary Bohannon, who is nearly white, about one sixteenth black, I should say. Mistreatment of slaves is and has been somewhat exaggerated, but old Aunt Mary had had the misfortune in her youth to belong to a man whose wife was a fiend from hell. The young slave women were fine young animals and barbarically handsome. I just, I should have probably prefaced this one. Uh, what year is he but, writing this? Nineteen thirty. Nineteen thirty. Man yeah. from Texas, writing writing H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. Hello, yeah. doctor. Yeah. What was that? It was on the Nina Simone episode where didn't they they refer to her as an animal at the New York Times yeah. review? Yeah. 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 No. So this yeah. is good. We're getting a little history lesson. You know that yeah. kind of language yeah. uh, didn't emerge out of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you understand Aunt Mary told tales of torture and unmistakable sadism that sickens me to this day when I think of them. Now, he's talking about her when she was a slave, right? Dude, that's like, that's so gnarly. And he starts his letter and he goes, now, this is this stuff is over exaggerated. But in this case, right, <laughs> right, yikes, right, damn. Right, right. Yeah, I should have prefaced this letter. A little. Hey. I missed my note. It, this You're is all right. There's going to be an ongoing kind of robbery. And in fact, we'll talk about in the after dark, we're going to talk about uh, two things. That are kind of related to this. One is a story by Robert E. Howard. One of his earliest stories called The Last Race. And guess what that's about. And we're also going to talk about one of the influences on Robert E. Howard's fictional, fictional um, Hyboria age in which Conan lives. The deep occult influences on that whole world that he came up with. Okay. Um, okay, uh, continuing on. Thank God the slaves on my ancestors' plantations were never so misused. And Aunt Mary told me how uh, told how one day, when the black people were in the fields, a hot wind swept over them, and they knew that old Mrs. Bohannon was dead. Returning to the manor house, they found that it was so, and the slaves danced and shouted with joy. Um, old Mrs. Miss Bohannon was like the evil slave owner wife. Uh, Aunt Mary said that when a good spirit passes, a breath of cold air of cool air follows. But when an evil spirit goes by, a blast from the open doors of hell follows it. OK, here's another little bit. <clears throat> and there was one Arabella Davis, I remember, whom I used to see when a child going placidly about town collecting washing. I mean, when I was a kid, not Arabella. She was a black philosopher, if there ever was one. Her little granddaughter tagged after her everywhere she went, carrying Arabella's pipe, matches, and tobacco with as much pomposity as a courtier ever carried the train of a queen. Arabella was born in slavery, but her, memory, her memories were of a later date. She often told of her conversion, when the spirit of the Lord was so strong upon her that she went for ten days and nights without eating or sleeping. She went into a trance, she said, and for days the fiends of hell pursued her through the Black Mountains and the Red Mountains. For four days she hung in the cobwebs on the gates of hell, and the hounds of hell baited her. Is that not a splendid sweep of imagination? And the strangest part is, it was so true and realistic to her that she would have been amazed had anyone questioned her veracity. Okay, so um, now thinking about, you know, how does a guy from the middle of Texas end up coming up with these stories? I mean, he he whatever a person thinks about the Conan stories and the many other Robert E. Howard stories, they're quite imaginative. Now he's writing for he's writing for money to make a living. And so sometimes this stuff is kind of rushed. And so sometimes there's a bit of a formula to how some of these stories work. But in terms of the details and the worlds he's building, quite imaginative. So you know, kind of wondering where does this guy come up with this stuff? Well, I think we're gonna sort of paint some strokes in and you're gonna kind of see where at least some of it came from. Um the you know, his the thing is living in the middle of Texas in the time he did. There was no radio. He didn't hear a radio really till he was like 16 years old. Obviously, no television. Um, his father was usually gone on trips. He was a country doctor, right? So his dad was barely ever around. Most of the time he spent, it was just him and his mom. And just picture that of a, a kind of a sickly woman, a little nervous, a little dramatic, loves her little boy, but that's kind of her thing. And her little boy, her and her little boy out in some little out in some little house, middle of Texas. They move around so much they don't know their neighbors. They don't know anybody around them. 
you know, no air conditioning, no air conditioning, right? Hot as hell. Um, yeah, just uh, picturing that is mm. it's it's a tough way to go. I mean, there's harder ways to go. You could be on you could be on Old Miss Bohannon's plantation. You know, that's worse, obviously. But sure. um, you know, a, a very per- particular a lot of lifestyle interiority that we don't have to experience. You're inside right. your own head a lot. Yeah, you can imagine yeah. when you get your hands on a book. Yes. Or yeah. A comic yeah. book or whatever right. they're reading at the time. That would be. Yeah. 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 She she would she would try to entertain him largely with stories, reciting poetry. She taught him to read before he ever went to school. And he was a very precocious reader. But as you say, it was kind of you couldn't know, get your hand on with whatever you wanted to read. It was very limited. It often wasn't a library, generally no bookstores. So. Um, oh, boy. Today we're going to read the book of Job. Again. Oh, golly. Oh, right. <laughs> mummy, mummy, please. Can we read the Psalms again? <laughs> right. You know, just right. that kind of thing. I mean, yeah. and hey, you could do worse. You could do worse. But sure. But, it but if, that's, like, if that's all yeah. there is, that's gets right. in your little, for a oh, little kid. Morde- Mordecai, Mordecai. <laughs> oh, golly, we're going to read yeah. the book of Revelation again. Oh, oh wee. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1915, the Howards finally come to Cross Plains. Uh, this is, you know, this is basically Cross Plains, Brownwood area. This is, you know, this is basically Robert Howard, E. Howard's uh, home for life. Dr. Howard, uh, they're moving there, was announced in the local paper. You know, he's a, he's a local, he's a doctor. He's coming to town. He's going to hang up his own, sh- his own shingle. And um, Howard, uh, sorry, Dr. Howard, Robert E. Howard's dad, had been chasing a boom forever the whole idea was i'll find the right spot if we get there as a boom a oil boom has happened we're going to be rich right and it's not stupid um <laughs> uh he gets there in time for the oil boom and cross planes they never really quite get rich but they don't for a time anyway they don't have to worry about money a whole lot though dr howard is you know, working, working pretty hard country doctor. You got to like travel all over all, you know, you got sort of a, a domain and you're traveling all over. Right. Sure. Um, let me read a, let me read a little bit. Um, I'm looking up, I'm looking up cross plains, Texas right now. We got, Oh yeah. Baseball, yeah. softball field, little yeah. Buffalo's daycare, cross mm. plains, high school, cross plains, community center, jeans, feed barn, Woody's mm. museum, Oh, yeah. Turkey Creek Rodeo Club. Looks like mm-hmm. a good time. Looks like yeah. a, you know you got the, you got your Baptist church and kind of mm-hmm. got your city mm-hmm. city on a grid here and mm-hmm. it is it's out there. Yeah. It's, it's out there. Yeah, there's not a whole lot around it. You know, you zoom out and it's like, oh yeah, that's by itself. Yep, yep. There. It's right there in the smack dab in the middle of Texas. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to read a little bit. This is actually from an autobiographical novel that um, Robert E. Howard wrote in 1928 called post oaks and sand roughs um and in here he he changed the name of cross plains to lost plains but nonetheless he's talking about this this town Uh, you know i missed a big one here dude (laughs) what's that bubba's bubba's smokehouse barbecue that's gotta gotta shout out bubba's dude that sounds awesome that sounds okay I'm literally <laughs> sal- salivating right now. I know. Dude, I know. dude uh, they've got I, they've got I, onion rings the size of your head. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Shout out to Bubba's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, quote, the oil bu- the oil boom struck uh, lost planes overnight. The town was deluged with oil workers and magnates. Abstracts flew like leaves in the wind. It was shallow, quote, town site stuff. And Derek sprang up in every backyard. Standard rigs built solidly of heavy timbers, sputters which moved on wheels and were an innovation in the Lost Plains country, which uh, was used to deep tests and star machines, which were merely glorified sputters, taller and able to go to a greater depth. Here was drama, swift moving action, and great material for story. But Steve, Steve is uh, his him. This, that's him in this story. But Steve moved among it untouched, despising oil and everything connected with it, hating the roughnecks who swaggered and jostled their way through life and detesting the loudmouthed, steely-eyed promoters, the keenest of whom had never opened any book in their lives except some book dealing with the oil industry. Steve spoke the truth when he said he hated them all too much to write about them. Um, and then here's a letter uh, to Lovecraft <clears throat> from 1930. 
Quote, I've seen towns leap into being overnight and become deserted almost as quick. I've seen old farmers bent with toil and ignorant of the feel of $10 at a time become millionaires in a week by the way of oil gushers. And I've seen them blow in every cent of it and die paupers. I've seen whole towns debauched by an oil boom and boys and girls go to the devil wholesale. I've seen promising youths turn from respectable citizens to dope fiends, drunkards, gamblers, and gangsters in a matter of months. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, you know, you are in this like kind of small town, sort of isolated from the rest of the world in a certain in, in, in a lot of ways. But if you're there when a boom happens, it's like you can see like like a mac a microcosm of like the industrial revolution happen like outside your window, right? Sort of. Um, it's a it's a weird like it's a weird way of like accelerating human history right in front of your face absolutely um, i mean there yeah. will be blood does a really good job of kind of mm -hmm. showing this yeah dr yeah dramatizing this yeah. yeah it happened to the state that i'm from man the, the mm -hmm. place that i'm from experienced this and i i haven't lived there for a long time but mm -hmm. i heard a lot about it i mean yeah. and when i went back i would notice it I mean, right. It was wild. Right. Dude. The whole Western North Dakota is unrecognizable to to what I grew up with. That was all like oil shale or shale it's oil. Shale wasn't it? oil. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, it peaked in 2012, but it kicked off in 2008. Man. And real estate prices went through the roof. Rent went through the roof. People would literally, like in my hometown, Mandan, Bismarck, Mandan, people would literally, they would, the housing market went nuts there because that has schools and services and whatever. And people, these guys would literally drive two hours. To, right. to go work, you know, they right. were flying in teams. This is a bit tangential, but no, okay. uh, this is they related. were flying. Yeah. They were flying in teams for like you know, it'd be like fourteen days on, twelve hour days. They'd fly them in from Denver. They would live mm -hmm. in Denver. Mm -hmm. They'd fly them up. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the kind of money you're talking about. Where right. suddenly, like, people were famously making six figures, like managing a Wendy's, right up there. Right. Totally right. nuts, right? Because yeah. you get some experience, and and the thing is, like, they need it. Whatever oh, is yeah. managing a wedding, well, it, Wendy's well, down to the oil work. Like you need these people for this business to keep churning, and it's only going to last uh, so long, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you also have to be willing to live in fucking Williston, North Dakota, where mm -hmm. it's like twenty men to every woman, right? right. And you got to be willing to in the winters. And I mean, they had they right. had guys living in, um, you know, uh, like trailers. Like I'm they sure. were just set up yeah. rows of trailers. Back I mean, yeah. yeah, wild. Yeah. But I mean, listen, if you're a young dude, you want to make some money, you want to make 180k a year. Oh, do dude, that for you're five years. I mean, dude, you know? you're yeah, you're 20 or something. Go do that for a few years. Sock away half of it or more. Come back, more. start a little business, doing something. Move to Florida. Right. Yeah, make yeah. make wise investments. I mean, listen. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the thing. These are people who yeah. work. This is like actual right. real work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not uh, you know increasingly adopting the phrase computer toucher. What do you do for work? <laughs> computer toucher. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go ahead soft. And do this for a while, Just right? lily soft. <laughs> and that's I would I wouldn't change a thing. But anyway, I but I respect this kind of thing. You're yeah, totally right sure. about that that rapid fire. Like we go from nothing to like here's the bank, here's the yeah. school. We're just gonna we're just gonna um, speed run Western right. civilization in five right. years, three right. years, right? Right, yeah, right, yeah. crazy, yeah. crazy. Mm. Um, now, so Robert, he gets to this cross plains area, and he, after this childhood of moving around, he actually gets to kind of stabilize into his identity a little bit. You know, he he starts to um, there's there's kind of a tall tale or a myth about Robert E. Howard as being this like completely isolated guy, um, and that's just not the case. He 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 was a he wrote 12 hours a day, so he was isolated in that manner, but he was sociable. People liked him. He liked other people. Um, he, uh, he, he starts to make some friends, um, uh, as, as a boy, he's, you know, he's this kind of kid who would lead the imagination games that you play as a kid. Right. Um, and he had buddies that he would keep from this, from the 19 teens, he would keep well into adult life. I mean, the guy he left his literary estate, he was friends with him when he was like, I think, 12 or 13. Um, so um, kinds of things that they did as boys, you know, go on hikes, they'd ride horses, of course, your rough housing. Eventually, they started boxing each other. Boxing was a big, a big thing to do back then. Um, you know, it was like the biggest spectator sport in the world was boxing at this time. Um, and he did, you know. He did start to read recreationally, but it wasn't something he was very public about at first because uh, 19 teens in a Texas oil boom town, reading was kind of for sissies, frankly. Um, 
And Looks like we got us a reader. <laughs> right. yeah. What you reading for? What you reading for? <laughs> Shout yeah. out to all the Art of Darkness fans. We right. know y'all are readers. Yeah, we respect right. and we respect you. Come into the telegram, t.me slash art of dark pod. We have a lot of fun there. The more yeah. the merrier. If you want to win everybody's respect, uh, join the chat, read the room a little bit, read the rules. We got rules, and then uh, post your favorite pen. Yeah. People love yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so his doc, his dad settles into his role as a doctor. Robert E. Howard settles into his role as a young man, and his dad settles into his role as a doctor, and he becomes not only a respected member of the community as a doctor, but he becomes a classic front porch Texas teller of tales. Right. And this picture, you know, in the one hand, you gotta imagine Robert E. Howard is a boy. He's reading pulp magazines and stuff in his room, but his dad's out on the front porch having a glass of whiskey and a smoke, and he's telling some bullshit story to a friend of his out on the porch, right? Um, so he's a leg polar, as they called him. Uh, <laughs> his his mother, you know, high strung, very formal by Texas standards, and she she tries to have like these little tea parties in the afternoons, and and it's an oil boom, like it doesn't really fit, you know. People, are, it's an oil boom town. Everybody's real working like. It just doesn't it just doesn't work. You don't have dinner parties and that sort of thing in this environment. Um, but she is, you know, she's sort of trying to live into this role of like a southern a southern lady, right? She's the daughter of a, a Confederate colonel. She wants people to know that her family is very respectable and all of this kind of thing. Um now in Cross Plains, <clears throat> Hester starts to seem to try and steer Robert away from her father. Or from his father a little bit tries to she she's we have a sort of a devouring mother archetype here and, and this is going to come up later uh, a lot very prominently in this story um something but this, something uh correlated between the desire to have tea parties and the devouring mother i think i think hey. lewis carroll kind of nailed it there's some sort of weird <laughs> could be resonance they're very, there they're very well they're very well could be um Robert E. Howard gets a little a dog named Patch. It's one of his best friends as a, as a boy. Aww. And Patch, Patch becomes a character in, in one of his books, uh, The Bulldog Breed. When Robert E. Howard at one point is writing a lot of boxing stories, these were apparently a very popular genre for a while with boxing story. You'd get a whole magazine and it would just be boxing story after boxing story, which I can't imagine. Like at some point it's like, yeah, we get it. The guy, they get into like, you know what I mean? How many boxing hmm. stories can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it ends yeah. in one of three or four ways usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just right, right. So I wonder, what, anyway. I wonder what yeah, I wonder what those boxing stories read like. I'm very curious. But again, yeah. different time. Different time. Yeah. We yep. just we want yep. we want anything that's exciting, anything that's like yeah, right. gonna right. distract right. us because it's 108 yeah. degrees out. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, here is a little bit about Robert E. Howard, uh, a little, a, one of the very few childhood anecdotes that we have. <clears throat> Quote, um, years later, Elsie Burns, the postmistress of Burkett, uh, would recall meeting Robert and Patch, his dog, on one of their outings. I'm Robert Howard, he said. I'm sorry if we frightened you. Patches and I are out for a morning stroll. We like to come here where there are big rocks and caves so we can play make-believe. Someday I'm going to be an author and write stories about pirates and maybe cannibals. Would you like to read them? <laughs> it's just a charming little little story. Yeah, um, cute. We got a dog. Pat, this is some weapons grade Americana. We got it, is. it really, it really is. My dad's the doctor. Do you know my dad, Dr. Howard? <laughs> Here's my dog, Pat. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna write about cannibals. Right, right. You cool. do that. You do that, Bobby. Yep. Yeah, uh so let's talk a little bit about his influence. So, you know, we've talked about this. We've kind of already hit this point. There's no good bookstores. There's barely a library. In in Howard's time, only 2% of all books sold in the country were sold in Texas. I don't know what that number is now, but I'm sure it's bigger. than. I mean, half the country lives in Texas. So, um, yeah. uh, and there's yeah, a couple like 10, very good schools the there country. too. Yeah. Yeah. There's some yeah. good schools down there. Yeah. Yeah. I've so, heard that. yeah. So where's, so where, where is he getting his influences? Right. Um, he's got his dad being the, the Texan storyteller and other Texan storytellers around, um, but are also influenced by tall tales and, you know, tall tales 
I don't know. Tall tales seemed like a big deal when I was a kid. I felt like we were they were really encouraged. We were really encouraged to to read them and know them when I was a kid. Um, and I think part of the reason is is it's it's not a uniquely American format, but it kind of is. The Paul Bunyan thing, Pecos Bill, and, and Calamity Jane, and all of these characters. Um, and it's a style of storytelling, right? It's got that exaggeration, but it's kind of always told with like a wink, you know, and and um, it's humorous. It doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, you know who were the the torchbearers of the tall tale? The Coen brothers. Mm. The Coen brothers love mm. a tall, old timey tall tale. Mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. they've embraced that folkloric American vibe. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's, Thank that's goodness they true. did because it, it it feels like if they hadn't, it it feels like we're at risk of that kind of going away. Yeah, I think that's true. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's read a little bit about um just about tall tales. Uh this is from uh a woman named Molly Boatwright. Or sorry, Modi Boatwright. Mm-hmm. Not not a not Modi a Boatwright. This is, a, this is a guy who wrote about Texas and American folklore. Okay. <laughs> Quote. Um the westward moving men of action, unhampered by any highfalutin theories of art, created their own literature. The pathos and tragedy of their experience they recorded in their songs, their zest for the hard life of the frontier and their prose tales. Had they lived in a pre-scientific age, they might have produced an odyssey or more probably a Beowulf. Since, however, the age of this serious folk epic had passed and they were essentially realists, their heroic literature took a comic turn. And in keeping with 19th century ideals, their comedy was the comedy of exaggeration. In the tall tale, they developed one of America's few indigenous art forms. Now, I think America actually has a lot of indigenous art forms, but nonetheless. Um, uh, so this was an influence. This was certainly an influence, the whole tall tale myth. And if you think about like what is Conan, he's sort of a tall tale within the world of within the Hyborian age. And we'll see more of what I mean by that as we go. Um, uh, some of his other characters, Steve Costigan, his sort of boxer character, also kind of a tall tale, kind of a big, dumb galoot, but like, you know stronger than anybody else there's a character called solomon kane who we're going to talk about who's definitely a tall tale type character um though less humorous um they have and the kind of thing that binds them together and conan is you know ludicrously superhuman qualities and and this wild evocative imagery like it's the 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 premise is always paid off they're this huge monstrously strong figure and that's always going to come into play right and and people love that story (laughs) <laughs> um this this is a good this is a good writing tip and kevin i think you'll probably agree with this um it's sort of like the Chekhov's gun thing but it's like you always got to pay off the premise like the, the the whatever the promise of that what is whatever the novelty of the setup the is you got to pay that the off. premise you got to pay yeah. it off i mean that's yep. a well-known thing right yep. and if, if you do have a gun in the first act it doesn't go off it's got to be a choice Right. It's got to be very deliberate. Right. right. They do this uh, really well in season two of uh, True Detective, which I'm rewatching. Oh. The woman, the woman with the with her knife. She's got that knife and she's going to there's a they have a conversation uh, with the she and the other detective uh, mm. oh. in season two are talking about how a, how a man can always overpower and kill a woman with a, with his bare hands. She's like, that's why I've got this knife. Any man who tries to do that to me is going to get it. And then mm-hmm. in one episode, there's a moment where she takes it out and you kind of think she's going to use it during the big shootout. And then she mm-hmm. finally ends up using it in that gnarly, like uh, sex party scene. And it's mm-hmm. like, it pays off so totally. You're like, you know, right. it's coming and then it happens right. and you go, oh, my God, right. she did it. Right. Yeah, it's right. crazy. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So yeah. I, but that's so true about writing. I mean, and that's the first the first third of the book. The rest of the book just has to unwind whatever you've set up. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. basically. But like, well, you do, yeah. you do need to do people, that. <laughs> people expect it. And, and, you know, and I yeah. think a lot of like young writers or a lot of like uh, people who are new to it kind of go, oh, I'll break the rules. And it's like, right. no, you fucking won't. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, yeah. no, you won't. Yeah. Try, we've been doing this for yeah, thousands no, of years, try, bro. Try Just playing by like... the rules first. And then, and <laughs> yes, then you can exactly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see if you could follow the rules first? Yeah. Try that. Right. And then yeah. see if you can do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. Tell that to some 23 year old, though. Sure. Sure. Everybody's got everybody got to figure it out themselves yeah, but yeah, yeah. um now when uh robert e howard is 16 um the radio comes to town this is 1922 and he actually helped bring the radio to town there was some kind of volunteer effort to like install install a radio repeater or something like that 1922 they get 
Um, they get radio, and now he can get national news stories about you know politics and things, and he can get sports coverage and all that kind of stuff. Good, good deal. There is a family trip to New Orleans in 1919, um, and this is a doctor. His his father is going to take a seven week supplemental course, um, something about getting ghosts out of somebody's uh, somebody's chest cavity. I, I don't know what it was about. Say, yeah, yeah, <laughs> bloodletting in you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, interestingly, though, so think about this too. They live in the middle of Texas, right? Middle, kind of middle of nowhere. They live in this little town, and they go to they go to New Orleans to do this um, to do this supplemental course. That's the big city, man. This is a big oh, yeah. deal. Robert still Howard's never been to a big. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's crazy, right? People still flock there. Great and town. As soon as they get there, Kevin, you probably know a little bit about this story. It's right in the middle of the famous New Orleans axe murders. Do you know about these at all? Uh, I, I, I believe it or not, I don't. Yeah. So there was this period in 1919 where. There were those axe murderer. Well, I think I think the thing I'm going to read actually describes it. Um, God, man, this episode was, is making me hungry. The axe murder doesn't have anything to do with it. We're talking about Bubba, <laughs> talking right, about cannibalism. Right. We're talking about axe murder, but the food in New Orleans. My yeah. God, yes, very good. So, <clears throat> quote: This is a this is a letter from Robert. E. I think this is a letter from Robert E. Howard. Yeah, yeah, this is a letter from Robert E. Howard talking about the axe murders. Quote, the axe man had butchered an entire family, hacked a young man and his wife to death, though they eventually recovered and killed their baby, a child of only a few months. This crime was the seventh or eighth of the sort committed within the last year. The victims had usually been Italian and, strange coincidence, had usually occupied the rears of corner grocery stores. The details of the crimes were usually the same. The murderer or murderers had chiseled out a panel of the door, reached through and sprung the catch, then entered and slain the victims with an atch, hatchet, or meat cleaver, usually using whatever they found in the victim's house and leaving the bloodstained implement as mute evidence of ruthlessness. Oh, I knew there was a lot of anti-Italian bias, but I didn't realize there was axe murder levels. I knew there were like lynchings and things. Uh, yeah, and of, of I don't Italians even or hangings. I'm not even or whatever. sure if it's necessarily like. It, I mean, it could have just been happening in an Italian neighborhood and not necessarily been. You know, it's mm. it, without yeah. having found the person and the only evidence. It's hard to sure. say what sure, the sure. motivations were, right? Um, but yeah, right. Well, imagine- sometimes, sometimes axe murder is its own reward. We know that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes you just want to fucking <laughs> apparently, apparently. Yeah. Um, but but you Yikes. know, it, it is it is interesting that Robert E. Howard never really left small town Texas. Shows up in New Orleans, and the news is just that like there is a mysterious axe murderer out there just chopping people to pieces. Like that's yeah. crazy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's you have to tough. imagine that's influential too on a guy who wrote some sure. of the most violent stories you're ever going to read. Certainly this was an evocative image. I mean, when this happened, he was 13 years old. That's young boy, like Dude. territory, right? How did yeah. I not hear about this? Yeah. The ax, the ax man of new Orleans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me ask yeah. you a question. <laughs> six dead, six injured. Oof. Mm-hmm. Damn dude. Crazy. Okay. They never All caught right. the person or anything. I don't think. Yeah. Okay. I did not yeah, but know. See, again, ba- back then, the detective work again was just like, well, the, the, well, he said he didn't do it. So I guess he didn't. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, and this is a town, too, where if you want to be a spooky detective, you, you got so many tarot readers and astrologists right. and right. just these. Right. Right. That's all you do. Mm. You just go, help me yeah. find that axe man. Well, that's stare right. Into my, stare into my crystal ball. Damn, yeah. dude. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like there should have been a movie made about this. Uh, yeah, about yeah, it should one. be. Maybe there is. I don't know. Maybe there is. Yeah, yeah. I've come across this story before for whatever <laughs> reason. Um, now there's another thing that's an influence. So what I'm kind of trying to do is tell you what some of the influences of Robert E. Howard are. Another big one is just Texas history. You got to think, like, you know, not that long ago. Forget about what you think is right or wrong, but the the truth is, not that long ago, if you were living in Texas. Not that long ago from Robert E. Howard's time. If you were living in Texas, you were probably fighting natives, right? Like it was violent and scary and mysterious in some ways. This is like undis- you know, it's frontier effectively, right? So that stuff's not that long. That's not that far back for, for Robert E. Howard. The stories are entirely so honest, like in terms of the whole of history, it's really not that far back now. No, it's not. No, not really. Yeah. yeah. You know, we like to, mm-hmm. one of the reasons America seems to want to sell accelerate so fast is mm-hmm. to shove that down as hard as possible because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's frightening. Yeah. 
if Robert E. Howard were still alive, he wouldn't be even 120 years old yet. Right. Which, you know, that's okay. That's not that far. That's not that. That's a very old person, right? <laughs> One very old person away. So, yeah, this stuff isn't that long in the past and definitely wasn't for him. This was like recent new, you know, you would have known people who fought who fought the tribes, right? Um, OK, so and because of this, I'm going to talk about my favorite Robert E. Howard story, uh, favorite Conan story, I should say. This is called Beyond the Black River, and I talked about this a little bit, but let's let's talk about a little bit more detail. So this comes out in 1935, two issues of Weird Tales. We've got Conan as effectively a mercenary on the frontier of Aquilonia. Aquilonia is the 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 the, the peak civilization of the Hyborian Age, the most powerful kingdom. Um, and while eventually Conan will be the king of Aquilonia in the Conan lore. This story takes place long before that time. So Conan is sort of associated with this Fort Tuscaline right on the Black River. This is the frontier province just on the other side of the river of the picked picked lands. And and for for Howard, the Picts are P-I-C-T, which were a real people. Um, The Picts represent um, just general barbarism. Right. This is this is who this is who your barbarian is. They're always there. Uh, and we'll talk more about the Hy- the history of the Hyborian age later. But just know that these are like the savages. Um, um, uh, now, in this frontier fort is very important for the Aquilonian kingdom, you know, overall strength and economic vitality and stability and all of these things. And yet there's something coming out. It seems to be something coming out of the black uh, beyond the black river. And it's this and, and, and killing people. And it's this Pictish wizard rabble rouser and militia leader named Zogar Sag, who also has a relationship, um, some kind of relationship with a swamp demon. Okay. Now Conan, this story is told through mostly through the eyes of this young guy, Balthus, who's sort of watching Conan and going along with him. Conan leads a kind of delta force out into beyond the Black River to see if he could take out Zogar Sag, right? Um, um, everybody dies in this party except for Conan, Balthus, our storyteller who got left behind in a canoe, um, and one other guy. And they they get uh, Balthus and the other guy, they get brought to this like deep forest ritual where Zogar Sag is rounding up the scattered tribes, the scattered picked a tribes for um an attack on the fort and he's performing some kind of ritual sacrifice of of conan's men um i'm gonna just read you some bits of this yeah this is uh, one of those see- names where it's like your name is your destiny you give a child the name zogar they're gonna end up in the forest <laughs> performing a ritual that's right that's right yeah 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 call so, it look- aptonym yeah, that's, that's a word right. I learned on Art of Darkness. Hey, we all we all learn a little bit on Art of Darkness. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now let me read a little. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of this, but this is like this. In my opinion, is this is like as good as Robert E. Howard gets. Like, I I I, I was having a good time reading this story. <clears throat> so again, out in a dark forest ritual, he's got the 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 the, pers- the point of view character like tied to a stake or something. Quote, a tense silence reigned as Zogar Sag turned toward the forest, raised on his tiptoes and sent a weird inhuman call shuddering out into the night. Somewhere far out in the black forest, a deeper cry answered him. Balthus shuddered. From the timber of that cry, he knew it never came from a human throat. He remembered what uh, Valanus had said, that Zogar boasted that he could summon wild beasts to do his bidding. The woodsman was livid beneath his mask of blood. He licked his lips spasmodically. The village held its breath. Zogar Sag stood still as a statue, his plumes trembling faintly about him, but suddenly the gate was no longer empty. A shuddering gasp swept over the village, and men crowded hastily back, jamming each other between the huts. Balthus felt the short hair stir on his scalp. The creature that stood in the gate was like the embodiment of nightmare legend. Its color was of a curious pale quality, which made it seem ghostly and unreal in the dim light. But there was nothing unreal about the low-hung savage head and the great curved fangs that glistened in the firelight. A noiseless padded feet, it approached like a phantom out of the past. It was the survival of an older, grimmer age, the ogre of many an ancient legend. It was a saber-toothed tiger. 
No Hyborian hunter had looked upon one of these primordial brutes for centuries, and more immemorial myths lent the creatures a supernatural quality induced by their ghostly color and their fiendish ferocity. The beast that glided toward the men on the stakes was longer and heavier than a common striped tiger, almost as bulky as a bear. Its shoulders and forelegs were so massive and mightily muscled as to give it a curiously top-heavy look, though its hindquarters were more powerful than those of a lion. Its jaws were massive, but its head was brutishly shaped. Its brain capacity was small. It had room for no instincts except those of destruction. It was a freak of carnivorous development, evolution run amok in a horror of fangs and talons. This was the monstrosity Zogar Sag had summoned out of the forest. Balthus no longer doubted the actuality of the shaman's magic. Only the black arts could establish a domination over that tiny-brained, mightily thewed monster. Like a whisper at the back of his consciousness rose the vague memory of the name of an ancient, ancient god of darkness and primordial fear to whom once both men and beasts bowed and whose children, men whispered, still lurked in dark corners of the world. New horror tinged the glare he fixed on Zogar Sag. The monster moved past the heap of bodies and the pile of gory heads without appearing to notice them. He was no scavenger. He hunted only the living in a life dedicated solely to slaughter. An awful hunger burned greenly in the wide, unwinking eyes. The hunger not alone of belly emptiness, but the lust of death dealing. His gaping jaws slavered. The shaman stepped back. His hand waved toward the woodsman. So anyway, this is... There's some <laughs> alliteration in there that I would edit out, but at the yeah. same time, no, not my yeah. job. Like right. it's actually pretty awesome. That one line about the mighty muscle mar or whatever it is. <laughs> right, I actually right, remember right. like, it's like, yeah. wow, dude, it goes so hard. That's, you know, that's, that's the thing. What I like, what I love about it is like, in some ways it's not for me in some right. ways, I'll, I'll be honest with you. But like another way, it's like, Robert E. Howard commits to the bit so hard, you have to kind of respect it, right? There's no like, there's no wink like of like we're this is kind of a joke. It's like, mm -hmm. no, this is a jungle ritual where we're calling ancient monsters out of the, you know, like we're not. <laughs> I, there's there's no irony, none of it. There's there's not a single sh sh in, in any of the Conan stuff. There's not even like a little tinkling of irony, and I kind of love that in a way. Um, yeah, it's dripping yeah. with power. It's like, I'm just mm -hmm. going to throw every word and I'm not going to pull any punches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right, ah, right. It's, yes, it's yeah. metal. It's metal, yeah. dude. It is metal. Yeah. And so so in that story, like, yeah, this this wizard, he calls forth a saber-toothed tiger and then he calls forth this huge snake, like a giant snake. It makes me snake. feel like I'm like 14. It's like a big 14-year-old yeah. boy energy, it right? Is. Yeah. Totally yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah, totally is. Yeah, totally is. Yeah, and then the big snake shows up and Conan like bursts out of the woods with a huge sword and he's just chopping heads. <laughs> off <laughs> and every single conan rocks. story somebody gets their skull split so conan brings the sword right down their middle and it's always like cuts down to the breastbone <laughs> it's <just> like it's <laughs> yeah. incredible not yeah i think around. i think in addition to the i the irish uh robert e howard is the one you know freud there was nothing freud could have done with him <laughs> right <laughs> You can't yeah. psychoanalyze this guy. No, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> you can try, but I think yeah. you're probably going to end up in a world of hurt. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, it, it's so Robert E. Howard, he writes a bunch of different kinds of stuff. So, you know, he writes his Conan stories and he writes he writes that stuff. Towards the end of his career, he was focusing more and more and, and thought that he might turn entirely to writing Westerns. Um, it, it was sort of, a, he started writing, some of his first stories were Westerns, and then he does this whole arc, and it was at the end, he seemed like he was going to be writing Westerns again. And in fact, he, he wrote a bunch of Westerns. One of the best for people out there who wants to read a Western is this uh, story from 1932 called The Horror from the Mound. And in that story, Robert E. Howard basically invents the genre of of the weird Western. It's it's Cthulhu. It's like Lovecraft, but in the Wild West. Um, it's quite good. It's scary. It's weird. It's different. Um, you might, yeah. And there, and he has a few of those, but that the horror from the mound is probably the best. Um, okay. Another big influence on Robert E. Howard is the pulps. Uh, for people who don't know, let me give you just like the briefest history of pulp mag American pulp magazines. 
1882, a guy named Frank Muncy, who was a former telegraph operator in Augusta, Maine, comes to New York to get into the publishing industry, starts with the starts uh, a magazine, a children's weekly magazine called Golden Argosy. By 1896, it evolved into a monthly magazine printed on cheap paper using cheap printing processes and targeted at an adult audience with evocative fictional content. People don't know the reason it's called pulp is because you printed it on like the lowest quality paper to make it cheap, uh, as opposed to the slicks, Harper's and the Saturday Evening Post, I think, and and the uh, Harp and uh, the Atlantic. Those were the slicks. These are the pulps. This is the this is the garbage right this is like and, and another, and another, another world you and i were born in like 1880 and we're taking art of darkness on the road and you're slick yeah. and i'm pulp right hello hello my lady hello my dog yeah. <laughs> hey, come out playing the squeeze box <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, you go. yeah. <laughs> art of darkness live in october yeah. we're gonna yeah, do yeah, Houdini yeah. And Detroit, so get ready for that oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah uh, by 1903, <laughs> I'm sorry. That would be. I just love this idea of this like old timey uh, vaudeville act, pulp and slick, be, like a literary great. literary vaudeville act. Right. <laughs> like Tell has stories. a monocle. He thinks he's yeah, fancy. Yeah. 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 yeah pulp, see, a child yeah, Dickens. Yeah. See. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, by 1903, Frank Muncy's Argosy magazine had a circulation of 500,000. Um, mar this market grew rapidly and expanding into quote unquote spicy love stories, detectives, westerns, war fiction, eventually speculative fiction and fantasy. Uh, this latter and no small fantasy, the the prominent the eventual prominence of fantasy was in no small part due to Robert E. Howard's contribution. Um, eventually, out of this pulp milieu, you get what we think of as comic books with The Shadow, uh, a detective magazine. Um, coming out in, oh, I didn't note the year, but but there's a lineage to all of this stuff, right? Um, by the time Howard was becoming a writer, there were a bunch of pulp options. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit from this great Mark Finn uh, biography, Blood and Thunder, about that. Um, yeah, so let's see. <laughs> Quote. The mag these magazines, the, the pulps, were a direct descendant of the so-called dime novels, those quaint Victorian publications, often about real-life people and incidents, publications that were more filled with lurid purple prose than actual fact. Be that as it may, the pulp, pulp market was huge, a thriving enterprise that started in the late teens and early 1920s, survived the Great Depression and World War II until it was eventually overthrown by the paper book, paperback book market. Were the pulps violent? Some were. Were they badly written? There were some atrocious writers, sure, but the industry that produced such appalling dreck also gave us authors like Dashiell Hammett, uh, Raymond Chandler, Harold Lamb, Edgar Wallace, Edgar Wallace, Tennessee Williams, Elmore Leonard, Robert Block, Richard Matheson, Philip K. Dick, Louis L'Amour, Ray Bradbury, Horace McCoy, David Goodis, uh, Cornell Woolrich, Fritz Lieber, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Clark Ashton Smith, H.P. Smith, Lovecraft, and, of course, Robert E. Howard. The pulps were a cultural artifact of the populist movement with their egalitarian treatment of their readers, their focus on meat and potatoes entertainment, free of any high-handed notions of society or style, and their economic value. They were an American institution, one that is largely responsible for our contemporary American literary voice. And that last part, I think, is very true. Um, yeah, I think uh, there is a certain... I mean, our movie, most of our movie... like. Hollywood, most of the Hollywood movies are effectively pulp. They're in the lineage of 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 this kind of storytelling. Um, the big tentpole, you know, comic book and action movies are all come from from American pulp. That yeah, you think about that. you think about Jaws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You think about and, Alien, mm -hmm. Indiana Jones. Yeah. 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 They're all it's they're pulp. all kind of pulp. And and that's not saying they're bad. It's not necessarily it's saying they're good either. It's just that's the, that's the sort of that's the style of them. Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah. something like Blue Velvet is a little pulpy. Pulpy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So, Howard becoming a writer, Robert E. Howard becoming a writer. He writes his first real story at the age of 15. And this is a story called Big Smalley and the Power of the Eye about two Canadian hunters and their humorous struggle to construct a bear trap. <laughs> I just think that's a funny, it's a funny conceit. Um, he, he often, he often wrote humor too. Like a lot of his story, a lot of the stories he sold were, um, were comic. Um, uh, oh, I already, I already read that part. So, okay. 
fast forward a little bit, 1922, uh, Robert E. Howard has to change schools. And the reason for this is that the Cross Plains uh, High School only went up through the 10th grade. I don't know if they didn't have enough people, they didn't have the resources or what. But he has to move to nearby Brownwood, about 35 miles to the south. And his mother comes with him. It's going to be not enough people. Probably. That's, yeah. 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 They would, and there was, yeah, they would consolidate into the high school from different right. communities. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So they moved to nearby Brownwood. His mother comes with him. So it's like he rents a little house in Brownwood or whatever while he goes to school. But here in Brownwood, um, he meets two friends. Brownwood's a little bit bigger city or, ta- or bigger town. And while he had friends in Cross Plains, here he meets people who also are into books for the first time we're into philosophy who read a little bit and that's that's it that's an interesting experience for a young boy when you, you you've been kind of alienated from everybody around you and then you then you run into somebody who's into some of the same stuff you are that's like a big deal right and you're you know it's, it's, uh junior in high school um and you know very quickly he's starts getting his stories howard does in the tattler which is the brownwood high school's newspaper he wins a contest with two stories called one called golden hope christmas and another called west is west which is a humorous western uh of which he wrote many uh one of these friends that he makes is this guy tevis clyde smith who um has a small printing press um and he turns out uh he's part of the something called the Lone Scout Organization, which apparently was like a spinoff of the Boy Scouts. And it was designed for the rural community. So like boys could be Lone Scouts by themselves, obviously. And like, you're like a Boy Scout by correspondence almost. It's it's <laughs> like the solo poly of Boy Scouting. <laughs> right, right. There you go. That's fair. Yeah, yeah but that's yeah. fair. I mean, if you if you don't have it, that is rather sad, though, isn't it? It is. A that is bit. rather yeah. sad. But you're I mean, I, get, but, yeah, yeah. but you're trying to give a give a young man something and maybe he doesn't have a troop that he can be part of. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, if Art of Darkness fails, dude, I'm going to be a Lone Scout podcasting. <laughs> it's going to be real right. sad. <laughs> Hello? Is this thing on? <laughs> Yeah. Is there anybody <laughs> out there? As the man uh, said. <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> um, he, uh, there's also, I want to talk at this point, I do want to talk about Robert E. Howard's, I think he had like graphomania or hypographia. Um, that's addition- coming over with the writing. That yeah. really is. I mean, and mm-hmm. listen, that's, if you're affected by that, being a pulp author in the 30s and oh, yeah. 40s is that's where you want to be. That's uh, lean into it. Yeah. Well, didn't yeah. didn't uh, LRH LRH peace be upon yeah. him. Uh yeah. he was also gra- like a graphic yeah. maniac and he wrote for the pulps too, didn't he? He did. Yeah. He, he did. Was yeah. it on that list you read earlier? You left it No, out. I think I I think, you know, he might who knows. It's better to just not mention him, I think. Sure. You sure. sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now so in addition to all these stories he wrote, all you know, this is these two books I have are probably an eighth of everything Robert E. Howard wrote, something like that. Um, he also wrote um, over 800 poems in his lifetime. And we're not going to spend a lot of time reading the poetry, but I, I thought I would read one just so you can hear it. See what a Robert E. Howard poem is like. And this does, is probably uh, one of the better ones. Does uh, does uh, Conan cleave someone's head in twain in every poem? <laughs> yeah, no, he should. That'd be awesome. They just all end with that. Or what it's, it's like, like about. He, <laughs> doesn't matter what he it's just about. seems like he achieves like a postmodern meta commentary on. Right. <laughs> yeah. Something that that is, would be yeah. pretty good. Is this like any poem, idea. no matter what it's about? It's a love <laughs> poem. It's a nature poem. Whatever it is, it ends with Conan leaping, leaping out. And cleaving someone's skull to the breastbone. That, that's a hundred percent something you could submit to Apocalypse <laughs> Confidential. They would print the shit out of it. They that. should. Yeah. <laughs> Free ideas for everyone. Yeah, that's right. So this is a this is a this is a poem called uh, the Ghost Kings. Uh, quote: The Ghost Kings are marching. The midnight knows their tread from the distant stealthy planets of the deem of the dim unstable dead. There are whisperings on the night winds, and the shuddering stars have fled. A ghostly trumpet echoes from a barren mountain head. Through the fen, the wandering witch lights gleam like phantom arrows sped. There is silence in the valleys, and the moon is rising red. The ghost kings are marching down the ages' dusty maze. The unseen feet are tramping through the moonlight's pallid haze, down the hollow, clanging stairways of a million yesterdays. 
The ghost kings are marching where the vague moon vapor creeps, while the night wind to their coming like a thunderous herald sweeps. They are clad in ancient grandeur, but the world unheeding sleeps. So, um, that's a Robert E. Howard poem. He wrote eight, more than 800 of them. Um, All right. All right. Yeah. Poetry is a good thing. You got, you got writer's block. You're trying to figure something out. It's a good place mm-hmm. to kind of fall mm-hmm. back on. And obviously, that's uh, that isn't meant to diminish the craft of poetry. Like serious sure. poets are, yeah. yeah, the greatest writers, uh, really. And Indeed. Uh, but yeah, hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, in May of 1923, he graduates from high school, and there's a bit of uncertainty about what he's going to do. Um, but Howard knew that the only thing we really interested in him was writing, and you know he's already refining the themes. That he would he would work the rest of his career, um, and in in a big part of like the theme, what is the theme of Robert E. Howard's work? And you might think with a pulp writer cranking this kind of stuff out that there really isn't one, but I think in Robert E. Howard's case there is. And for Robert E. Howard, it's a sort of a dreamlike recapitulation of history, not idealizing things, not you know whatever the opposite of idealizing things is. But using the shape of history to articulate, I think, something about human nature. I think this is what he was actually trying to do. Um, And let me read you a little bit about um, his vision of history. Um, I think this is interesting. Um, This is uh, he wrote this in a letter to um, Tevis Clyde Smith. (laughs) Um, Yeah, quote. Rome spread her, and he wrote this, I think, when he was, I think he wrote this in 1923, so he's like 18 years old. Quote, Rome spread her empire across the world, then she became dissolute, debauched, and the barbarians drove in. The tribesmen of Genseric, of Attila, of Alaric raided, looted in the very streets of Rome. Cathay was the mightiest nation of Asia, then she forgot her skill in war for debauchery, and the Mongols swarmed across the Great Wall, and Genghis Khan rode his horse into the palace of the emperor. The nations of Central Asia had become effeminate and rich and proud. The Tartars came from the northern steppes and Tamerlane built his mighty empire over their ruins. When India turns from war to trade and becomes debauched, the wild tribesmen of Afghanistan come down the Khyber Pass with torch and sword. When a nation forgets her skill in war, when her religion becomes a mockery, when the whole nation becomes a nation of money grabbers, then the wild tribes, the barbarians, drive in. Who will our invaders be? From whence will they come? Where but from Asia? Can a nation ally the Tartars, the Mongols, the Indians, the tribes of Asia? And he goes on from there. But this is that meme that's like, uh, what is it? Uh, good time. What is it? Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create bad times. That's great hard like, times. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. that's Robert E. Howard's would. I would say Robert E. Howard would see that and nod his head. Right. Um, and he was constantly concerned that society would allow itself to devolve. And then as it devolved a force, a people who were perhaps less sophisticated, but hadn't forgotten the, the physical gritty reality of being, you know, living things would, would sweep in and take over from them. Um, comes up in his stories all the time. It's the story of the Hyborian age and, and it's, you know, what he is probably the thing he was most paranoid about happening. Um, now, I think according to Mark uh, Mark Finn, the guy who writes this, you know, he kind of phrases this as like, well, there's a lot going on in Robert E. Howard's sort of adolescence and in the 1920s that might make a person feel this way. You know, he lists off, you know, the fact that World War One had basically just happened. Robert E. Howard was too young to to, to go. Um, but there's the Bolshevik revolution is going on. India was being decolonized. There was a depression in Europe. Eventually there'd be a depression in the United States. Um, you know, Mark Finn makes the point that Robert E. Howard may have seen himself as living in something like the end times, even though in his little town of Texas, that's not necessarily happening. Um, so he writes this letter. He's a, he's a Kali Yuga bro. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and he writes this letter, and we're going to talk more about this story he mentions in the After Dark, because I, I don't want to spend a ton of time in, on this, but I also don't want to skip it. And I want to keep in mind, he's 18 when he writes this. Okay. Um, Precocious. He's yeah. got a lot of big ideas already. Yeah. 
He says, quote, I shall write a story entitled The Last Man as a warning to the white races. Oh, if the West falls before the East, it won't be because I haven't warned the white races. So now he's he's drawing on another theme that we've talked about through uh, uh, Shelley, the last man. That's yeah. that's an old motif going back. Okay, so he's yeah. so he so you're telling me he's concerned about the white races uh, uh, having uh, uh, being being overrun by uh, by people. Okay, okay. and he's corresponding with H.P. Uh, Lovecraft too. Um, eventually he is at okay. this point. And what, and what year not. is this? What year is this? That he's 18 this would be 1923, 1923, okay. 24. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, and here's, here's kind of, I, I want to kind of color this in. So I think, I think it's fair to say from that time that he's 18 years old, his ideas fundamentally don't change, but I think he becomes a lot more sophisticated. And I think his understanding of race at the age of 17 or 18 was his touch points were this is a place that Europeans fought a pitched battle with the native tribes. There were countless race riots in Texas, including in the time of Robert E. Howard's cognizance. Um, There were Mexican raids on border towns all the time. Um, There was something called the San Diego plan. Are you familiar with the San Diego plan, Kevin? Sounds like a funk band from yeah. The Google, Google the Google the San Diego plan really quick. The quite. San Diego plan. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's in, it's interesting. I didn't I didn't know anything about this thing before, but yeah. So, so like my point is not to not to run cover for any of this stuff. But uh, what I want what you want to understand is Robert E. Howard is a very parochial parochial provincial young man in the 1920s who had some fairly un fairly lunk-headed notions about race when he was a young man fair enough but also standard for the day and not unrecognizable Mm -hmm. in terms of today's discourse so let's not act like we're shocked or no uh taken aback by this kind of language because people are literally still having the same conversation today yeah, 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 so, exactly, exactly. Here we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, by 1929, uh, what, six years later, he's writing stories like Skull Face, in which the white Europeans are cave-dwelling savages and the Atlanteans, the, the sophisticated people, are brown-skinned, right? Most of his villains are white Europeans, fundamentally. Um, you know, I think... Yeah, I think it's more about for him. It's more about barbarism versus civilization than it really is about race versus race. Um, and so, yeah. Anyway, um, there is one little bit I want to read on this. Did you pull up the San Diego plan? Yeah. What is the San Diego plan? Do you want me to read a little bit about sure, this? Sure. Yeah. 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 The, the interesting pl- little historical note. The plan of San Diego. And here I'm going to work on my Spanish. Yes. Plan de San Diego. <laughs> was a, a plan how did i do i nailed it right that was great um, yeah yeah uh, i my, think san diego can... stands for a whale something a whale's vagina something uh, what isn't that from the uh, anchor man oh god yeah. <laughs> he says something on a date will ferrell's character says something on a date she's like do you know what san diego means uh, uh, okay about. anyway yeah sorry. very good yeah anchor man's classic yeah. uh it was a plan drafted in san diego texas in, in 1915 by a group of unidentified mexican and tejano rebels who hoped to seize arizona new mexico california and texas tejas from the united mm-hmm. states the plan was never attempted It called for a general uprising in February of 1915 and the assassination of every non-Hispanic Caucasian male over 16 years of age. The Mm -hmm. arena included all of South Texas. Germans were excluded from the killing. Wunderbar. The the San Diego plan collapsed. Well, of course, because we know German German Americans aren't white. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, Robert E. Howard is Irish. He wasn't at this time either. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. That's so funny. I love this. It's like, we're going to get all of the white people except the Krauts. (laughs) (laughs) Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who knows i mean it, it, this appears to be real uh it, but it, it was never okay i mean it never happened obviously but it was a plan but fascinating yeah yeah so that would Very have been that would have been like okay. a big news story at sure like, when robert e. howard's a kid right yeah that'd make you a little yeah. paranoid you might you might start going around with leader hosen 
Right, right, right. You know, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, yeah. it's the Passover yeah. blood is you just start eating sauerkraut and yeah, uh, yeah, maybe drinking yeah. a little more. Let me let me read a quick poem about from Robert E. Howard. This is written, I think, in 1925. <clears throat> Quote, the day that I die, shall the sky be clear and the east sea wind blow free, sweeping along with its rover song to bear my soul to sea. They will carry me out of the bamboo hut to the driftwood piled on the lee. And yea, that name me in after years, this shall ye say of me, that I lived to a straight and simple creed, the whole of my worldly span, white or black or yellow I dealt, for square with my fellow man. So, anyway. Okay. So, it wouldn't be until 1924 that Howard would sell a story first to Weird Tales. And this is a story called Spear and Fang, which is a Paleolithic action adventure story about a Cro Magnon man fighting a Neanderthal over, they're fighting over a beautiful cave woman. Uh, he would be paid on publication. Weird Tales. Barnesburg Reith would say, yep, I want your story. We'll pay you when it shows up in the magazine. And then sometimes a month would go by. Sometimes a year would go by, um, which is a very unstable way to try to make a living as a writer. But when has it ever been stable for a writer to try and make a living? Uh, in <laughs> in the meantime, after high school, um, Robert E. Howard's working a variety of jobs. He works for a tailor. He heaves freight at the train depot. He hauls a survey rod. He acquires news for an oil biz, uh, an oil business column for the local paper. He ends up going to Howard Payne Business School in Brownwood um, in June of 1924 to take classes as a stenographer. Um, uh, anyway, he sold. Oh, I should have said this before, but he sold his first story for uh, Spear and Fang for about two hundred and fifty dollars in today's dollars. Um, but by late 1925, he's making more than a thousand dollars a story in today's dollars for selling to weird weird tales and when you can crank out a couple short stories a week the way he could that's not too shabby right um so anyway this this kind of process he's, he's doing stenography and various odd jobs goes on until and publishing the occasional story goes on until 1926 when he takes a job at the drugstore for people who don't know like classic americana the drugstore was not only where you went and got your your prescriptions filled that's where you hung out he went and he got a soda, sat at the soda fountain. He was a soda jerk. He was the head soda jerk, in fact. Um, and he was making a pretty good scratch. He was making $1,400 a week in today's dollars, but he was also working seven days a week and his writing ground to a halt in uh, 1926. So now we've got much money from jerking the soda. Jerking the soda. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, Gracious. I think, just means you're just filling soda. You're just pulling the soda. You're I'm just sure. jerking. Yeah, you're yeah. just making giving people their their soda yeah. pop. That's what I'm saying. That's that's pretty good money. That's that. that's very good money. There's <laughs> a lot of people right now who'd be happy to bring in fourteen hundred yeah. a week. Yeah. Now you're working yeah. six or seven days a week. That's tough. But fair, still, fair enough. Fair still enough. Still the checks coming in. You know. There you go. Um, okay, so I want to give you a little bit of a let's give it a little bit of a better. Now we we got full grown adult Robert e. Howard. Let's get a little bit better picture of him. Um, He's a pretty well-read guy, especially by small town Texas 1920s standards. He's probably the, he's probably the best read guy in town. I would say that's probably fair. Um, you can see in some of the stuff I already read that he's got a lot of historical knowledge, right? Um, uh, um, he also has he's also kind of sensitive as other right a, a man who wrote 800 poems might be a little on the sensitive side. Uh, <laughs> he also very much struggled to take orders from people. Um, this is why he didn't last very long at many jobs. He just didn't like being told what to do. Who does? Um, he liked to box recreationally. He started he started boxing pretty like pretty frequently. It was like his main hobby was boxing. He would just especially when he was working at the drugstore, he would work all day and then he would go down to the ice house and he would just get into like some kind of semi formalized punch up with somebody. Um, and to get better at boxing, he would work out. Um, and his exercise regime would be like chopping firewood, um, hitting tires with sledgehammers. We've since returned to this kind of thing in some quarters of the fitness community. Um, he also apparently had sleepwalking incidents. And I'm going to read a little bit on that because it's kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, quote, Robert took a trip to Brownwood in late April or early May. I think this is 1926. Yeah, 1926. And he spent the night with his friend Clyde Smith. That night, Robert had one of his sleepwalking incidents. Robert's terrified screams woke the whole house. Smith, groggy, opened his eyes to find Robert grappling with a large shape and, thinking an intruder was in the house, jumped in to help. Before he could do anything, Robert would he went headlong out the closed window through the screen. The Smith family had found Robert outside wandering around, apparently dazed. Smith had been uh, told previously what to do by Robert in the event that a sleepwalking incident happened. Talk to Robert until he fell back asleep. Once Robert closed his eyes again, Smith woke his friend up. Robert started Robert started awake. I'm glad you woke me, he said. I dreamed I was in, I saw a newspaper and the headline said Axe Murderer Slays 3. When Smith told him what had happened, Robert said, "I'm glad you couldn't get to me. I have the strength of a goddamn ape when I'm in the middle of one of these nightmares." Robert suffered cuts on his face and a deep gash in his arm. Smith's mother recalled that Robert had let out the most chilling scream she had ever heard. Dave Lee, another of Robert's friends from Cross Plains, also confirmed, Ro confirmed Robert's nocturnal struggles in an interview with uh, Howard Waldrop. Quote, Robert would tie his right hand to the bed because he had violent dreams and would wake up swinging. So, yeah. Um, and in addition to all these things, Robert E. Howard had a bit of a morbid sensitivity or a morbid streak. And here's a letter he wrote. He had a bit of a misunderstanding with one of his friends uh, over a girl, not quite a fight, but almost. And uh, it led to, uh, well, he kind of explains the pertinent part in this letter, I think. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me just read this. <sighs> yeah. Okay. So he, he, um, well, how does this work? To kind of mess with his friend, he started kind of flirting with this girl that his friend was interested in. But he uh, Howard didn't expect the girl to be like also interested in Howard. So it started as kind of like a joke, apparently. And then the girl was into it. And so it got some feelings were hurt and there was some confusion about what had happened. And then Robert made some dramatic claims about things. And this is where this letter picks up. <clears throat> uh, quote. Now I have, like a blind fool, outraged friendship and trampled on the souls of the best two friend, friends a man ever had. So I sat and thought and the lights went out over town. The raucous rab, rabble in the street sank and vanished. Still I sat and even money-crazed, oil-crazed speculators staggered home to bed. I sat and thought. My thoughts ran. Shall I live and continue to be a failure to grind my life out at last pass on? A failure among failures or... I shall never, I really never expected to leave the office when I entered it alive. I sat and the night passed and cold sweat stood upon my forehead as I fought my silent battle. Something kept whispering over my shoulder. Come, take a chance. You're a born failure. You lost the game before you saw it. The cards were stacked against you before you sat in the game. You're a damned fool and shall never be anything else. Now you've probably ruined a girl's life and that of your best friend. A great thing. You'll never win. It's no disgrace to take a flop when you're hung on the ropes and know you're licked. And you know it. You won't admit it, but you know it. For the first time, you're ready to admit it. What's the use of all this? You shall be mine eventually. You are only dust and dust is your eventual destiny. Why delay? Why drag out a few more years? Come, fool them all and step out of the game. Why stay with this torture of life any longer? Come, you are licked and may as well admit it. I have no fear of the hereafter. An orthodox hell could hardly be more torture than my life has been. I got so far along that I was chuckling with a ghastly humor as I thought what a hell of a jolt the man who opened the law office next morning would get. So he's describing sitting in his office and thinking about offing himself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. And, and he's uh, using boxing metaphor too. Right, right, uh, right. I'm licked. You're licked. You're up against yeah. the ropes, kid. Yeah, just yeah, throw in the towel. Yeah. One thing held me back. No high and noble resolve. No wish to make myself better for what I've tried again and again and failed. One thing. The vicious stubbornness that won't let me admit defeat. To have done what I considered would have been to admit that I was licked. I felt licked all right, but stubbornly despised to admit it. And actually, against the whole desire of my soul, that stubbornness won and sent me reeling out of the office just as dawn was breaking. I worked all that day and the next. I haven't a real job, but I don't give a damn. I've been that way before. I ate breakfast yesterday morning with the exception of some milk and a saucer of cereal. That's all I've eaten since. The two days before that, I, I ate dinner once. That may give you some idea of how I've been working. Okay. Now, at some point, 
Robert E. Howard can't handle this working. He's taught he can't handle like these seven days a week. And, you know, if you if, you know, I don't know, I don't know, Kevin, you've probably been in this place. I know I've been in this place when you're on when all you want to do is write or create something or make something and the ideas are there and blah. Working a 12 hour day for something you don't care about is kind of excruciating, <laughs> especially day in, day out, every day. You know, and you're like, work, I don't work in yeah. two hours for something <laughs> you don't care about is torture. Right. It is. You got to have buy in and you, and you mm -hmm. have to have, like, I can endure a 12 hour day doing something I don't like if the end result is something that out paces like that suffering and if there's a light at the yeah. end of the tunnel it's right. so funny like now people people don't want to work anymore and it's like yeah is there a light at the end of the tunnel right right are what things get getting when better they... oh yeah. what is they'll it never yeah. oh they'll never be able to buy a house they'll oh, never okay. be able to retire or buy a house right right yeah it's and like well uh, and they're and they're not sure they yeah. don't want to come into work huh, huh yeah huh. they don't want to work for 15 an hour anymore huh that's crazy. You're telling me this for the first time, <laughs> right, you know, right. like, yeah. holy shit. Dude. Yeah. 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 So in 1926, Howard had sold a few stories, which is a big deal. It's not like anybody else in town's ever sold a story or even try, you know, and it's on a national magazine. So it means something, even though it's not a lot of money. <clears throat> um, at some point, uh, and, and, you know, again, his hobbies at this point are literally working all day. And then he goes down to the ice house and gets in a fight. <laughs> kind of based. Kind of, rock, kind of rocks. Yeah, I was going to say based. Yeah. Based. Um, and that's what, and the, so, you know, if this, if this podcasting thing doesn't work out, man, we can, we can move to somewhere in Texas. Right. Near Austin. It'd be like yeah. Round Rock. We'll see yeah. where we can actually, what we can actually afford. <laughs> and we yeah. will make the Robert E. Howard gym slash lifestyle brand. There you go. Yeah. Right? We yeah. start at five. We start at four forty-five every morning. Right. And the first right. thing you're gonna do is you're gonna you're gonna cleave this this watermelon <laughs> right down the middle. <laughs> right. Check, and right. you're gonna repeat. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. We, we, yeah. It's a whole camp. It's like a work camp for mm -hmm. young men who uh, you know, we got the soda jerk station. Right. It's also a restaurant. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we got a little booth where you, you have to like yep. every day for 90 minutes, you've got to meditate on suicide. Yeah. <laughs> and you gotta you gotta write a letter. You know, you're gonna you gotta out talk this, yourself out of it. Talk yeah. Yourself yeah. Out of it. <laughs> I love it, dude. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's the bar the barbarian workout lifestyle. I like it. I like dude, it. Dude, you just imagine the Twitter account we get to promote that. And of course, all these guys, they also have to have Twitter accounts, they gotta retweet everything we tweet. Yeah, right. It's we're on our way to an epic grift. I like it. I like it. I always knew one day I'd have find my epic grift. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, he's going kind of crazy and he strikes up a deal with his father. And his father basically says, all right, Robert, you go finish. You got to go finish your bookkeeping course at Brownwood College. And then after that, once you got that certificate in hand, I will give you a year to figure out this writing thing. I will take care of, you know, live in the house. I'll take care of you for a year and we'll see how. And that's pretty cool, frankly. Like, that's a pretty cool thing for his dad to do. Um, now, so 